My partner and I have been preparing to do some experiments with solid and liquid helium. We're going to do experiments with liquid helium first and then solid helium. The basic idea of these experiments is that we want to study phase transitions in these materials by studying changes in the speed of sound. And we're going to detect the speed of sound by looking for resonance frequencies in a cavity resonator. And the resonance frequencies don't just depend on the size and shape of the cavity, it also depends on the density and rigidity of the material, which is why we expect the resonances and the speed of sound to change when there's a phase transition. Now, in my previous video, I showed you the preparations we were making, and we have just tested the resonator we're going to use. We did a bench test in air at room temperature, and we did find strong resonances. Now, we didn't just test it in air, we then put it in the doer and sucked all the air out so that we could show that it really was air resonances that we were seeing and not some part vibrating and the results showed that. Also in this video I explained the electronics. I explained the actual circuitry that goes with running a resonator like this. The diagrams that I have to explain the electronics aren't that pretty but they do the job. So this is the cell and we're looking primarily at longitudinal resonances between here and here. This transducer here made out of this membrane and that electrode will be the driver and this membrane and that electrode form a transducer that will be the detector. If you don't know how these transducers work, there's a DC bias voltage between these two which charges this. And then you can put an AC current on that which will cause the charge on this to oscillate which will apply a varying electric force on this membrane here. And that oscillation will allow it to drive it. Well, I actually said this one was the driver, so that's what will be happening there. Now, if we're looking at the detector one, the sound will move that membrane back and forth, and that will create an oscillating current, because it's charged and that's also charged, here, which will then be detected. We have a pre-amplifier there. Now, we have a DC bias voltage source here, but if we just applied it directly, then the problem we'd have is it would actually hurt the lock and amplifier because it would feed the DC bias voltage straight in there. Now the frequency generator and the lock and detector are in the same lock and amplifier. So the way we handle this is with a high pass filter. You notice these two capacitors there and these two resistors. Well think of these two resistors and those capacitors as just one big resistor for the moment. This capacitor combined with that resistor and that capacitor combined with that resistor form two separate high pass filters. So the high frequency signal coming from the lock-in or going to the lock-in can get through but the DC bias voltage is never going to hurt the lock-in. Now the other problem we have to worry about is the high frequency signal shorting straight through the DC source to the ground. Now we handle that by putting resistors here. These resistors not only serve to form part of the high pass filter but they also act as resistors which stop the AC from being able to short straight to ground. The next problem we have to worry about is cross-talking. We're going to have a signal coming from this end of the resonator and one going to this end, and because it's connected through this DC source, there's the risk that we'll pick up the signal in the detector here straight from the generator and not just through the resonator. So we have broken up the resistor here that we talked about earlier that was part of the high-pass filter there and also stopped the AC from shorting to ground through the DC source. Well, we've broken it up and put a capacitor in there, so it does some filtering too, which helps stop the cross-talking. The resistors and capacitors that you see in these various filters, they're contained in boxes in the lab, and we've got a DC bias voltage box and then an amplifier, also a pre-amplifier. And then, of course, the lock-in is connected to a computer, and it's controlled by the computer, the, the frequency generator is, and also it sends the data straight to the computer so that we can see it. Graft. Now I'm interested in showing you the equipment actually on the rack. This is the lock and amplifier that we're dealing with. That's the one that contains the frequency generator and the detector. Obviously that's the computer it sends the data to and it has the LabVIEW program that's controlling the frequency generator. This here is that pre-amplifier you saw on the diagram. This is the DC bias voltage source. Then all those resistors and capacitors that play a role in the filtration are in there and one other box. One each for the detector and the driver. This of course is the cryostat with the resonator at the end and that is active right now. Look at that. 
We're actually seeing a resonance finally. We have a successful bench test. That's a really broad peak. I mean, that started all the way. I didn't even get all of it actually. Starting at 12,000. Yeah, well, it's in air, so I guess it kind of makes sense that it would be a broad that, that's, peak. That's actually, that's a really clean it's shape. A, it's a very beautiful resonance. Yeah, it's not ambiguous at all. We're still taking data, and now that's really clearly going up, so we'll see if we get another resonance. It appears as though that resonance has peaked, that second one that we were looking at. Okay, so we've got a few smaller peaks on that shelf there, and then it started shooting way up crazy fast. This is insane. I don't know where this is going. I'm guessing we just hit another longitudinal resonance. We moved completely past this resonance, and then it seems like we're seeing another little one. Probably not a longitudinal one. Of course, the configuration of the transducer diaphragms in the resonator is longitudinal, so we would expect that the radial and azimuthal ones would only be weakly excited, which is why we get such high longitudinal spikes. Hopefully you can hear me over the noise, but since we successfully bench tested it, what we're going to do now is we're going to test it in vacuum to make sure the resonances that we saw were actually air resonances instead of some part vibrating. We suspect they are air resonances, but to prove that, we're going to suck all the air out by putting it in the doer as we have and vacuuming out the air. In the absence of air, if they were air resonances, well, they should disappear. Okay, so clearly it's just noise. Of course, there's going to be some spikes, but they're very short compared to any resonances we saw, and they're absolutely not in the same places. They're random and small noise. So the fact that we've got only noise over the range that covers the two biggest spikes means that in fact they were air resonances and not vibrating pieces of metal or pieces of equipment. So that's a good result. So now you've seen how the electronics work, you've seen my explanation of that, and you've seen the successful bench test in air at room temperature, and you've seen the vacuum test that showed that in fact they were air resonances because they went away when the vacuum was formed. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Dietrich out.